<clears throat> so we finished talking about Article I and Congress. We talked about the structures of it, and we talked about how it works day to day. What we want to talk about in this one is Article II. Article II talks about the executive branch. That's familiar to us as the presidency, but it's so much more. Article II, Section 1. Article II, Section 1 talks about the qualifications for a president, the pay, and it gives the oath of office. Now, before we get into the qualifications, just out of curiosity, the pay for the president is somewhat less than half a million dollars these days. Um, that's an interesting thing when we talk about that in class. Uh, some people think that's a lot of money. Most people think that's not really a lot of money uh, for somebody who is in charge of sort of running the country. Why is it, for example, a president can make, say, half a million dollars and somebody who plays baseball uh, makes tens of millions of dollars? Well, without disparaging any president, it boils down to laws of supply and demand. What does it take to run the country? Well, it takes um, maybe somebody who has the same skill set as an outstanding businessman, somebody who manages time well, who organizes people, who gives leadership, etc. How many people are great business leaders in America? Would somebody in charge of, say, Microsoft or Walmart or McDonald's, would they also have the same skill set to be a president? Perhaps they would. How about to be a great baseball player? What percentage of the population can be as good as, say, a, an Albert Pujols? Much smaller, that's why they get the money. It's supply and demand. Well, qualifications. To be president, there are three qualifications. You must be 35 years old. If you remember to be a representative, 25. To be a senator, 30. To be president, you have to be 35 years old. You must be a natural born citizen. That is a distinction. Uh, to be a, House of, a member of the House of Representatives, you had to have been a naturalized citizen or a citizen for seven years, but you could be naturalized. Same thing in the Senate, you could be a natural born citizen or naturalized for nine years. To be President of the United States, you have to be a natural born citizen. That is to say, no immigrant to America that has become a citizen can be President. That is prohibited by constitutional law. And the final requirement is that you must have resided in the United States for the last 14 years. This is it. These are the only requirements. 35 years old, natural born citizen, and a resident requirement of 14 years. Again, that might seem rather weak. It might seem like, wouldn't you expect your president to have you know, a certain background in terms of education? Wouldn't you expect them to have certain experience? Um, you know, maybe it would have been a good idea for them to say, well, you have to have served in political office for a while. Uh, maybe it'd be a good idea to say you haven't been a felon. Uh, all kinds of things might be good ideas, but the reality is, going back to our very first lecture, there was just an expectation of who would be president or who would be the kind of person that would be president. At the writing of the Constitution, everybody, everybody knew it was going to be George Washington. Most people felt like he would serve for life. They felt like he would simply be reelected until he passed away, and then we would elect another founding father, and that kind of thing. Uh, it was generally understood that the president was only going to come from the very upper crust of society, so there really wasn't a need to put in these other requirements. Well, Article 1, Section 1 talks about the qualifications, pay an oath. Article 1, Section 2, this talks about the powers of the president. Most important power he has, or at least the most important power that's mentioned here, is the commander in chief of the armed forces. The president has the power to order the armed forces into action. Now, this is an interesting dynamic because the president does not have the power to declare war. Only Congress has the power to declare war. That's part of that separation of powers that we talked about earlier. Congress has the power to declare war, but the president is actually commander in chief of the armed forces. This has brought up some issues in American history. What if the president orders troops into battle without a war being declared? Could that happen? Has that ever happened? Of course it has. It happened in Korea. It happened in Vietnam. Okay, neither of those were official wars declared by the United States. But in both cases, 50-plus uh, thousand Americans died in these, what was Korea, a police action, what was Vietnam called technically a conflict. Neither one official wars. That led to something in 1972 called the War Powers Act. In the War Powers Act, it said that the president can move people into action because there is a need for immediate response. 
It was understood that if, if we're attacked, it's not time for you know something, for example, like 9-11 happens. We don't necessarily need Congress to meet and every senator and representative to you know, make their speech and debate this for a while. We need to respond immediately. So the con president has the power to respond immediately. He must notify Congress, and they have 60 days to approve or not. That's the War Powers Act. Well, he has other powers besides being commander in chief. He has the power to make treaties. Those treaties must be approved by the Senate. He has the power to appoint ambassadors and judges, again, with the same conditions. They must be approved by the Senate. These are ways powers are separated, and yet there's a linking to make sure no one person has too much power. Article 3, uh, or excuse me, Article 2, Section 1, talks about his relations with Congress. And this details some of what I just mentioned that's talked about in Article 2. It also talks about that the president can call Congress into special session. Congress is scheduled to meet at certain times during the year. But what if a crisis comes up and Congress is on holiday? They are on vacation. They're not scheduled to meet for two or three more weeks. Congress, uh, or the president rather, has the power to summon Congress to say, get here right away, we're going to get started. Uh, perhaps the most uh, important one of these, or a big one of these that you might know about was during the Great Depression. When FDR, Franklin Roosevelt, was elected, one of the things he did immediately was call Congress into special session to pass legislation to get the country back on track. And lastly, Article 1, Section 4 talks about impeachment. And it says the president can be impeached for high crimes and misdemeanors. Over the course of our country's history, two presidents have been impeached. Now let me help you with this word a little bit. To be impeached does not mean to be found guilty. To be impeached means to be put on trial. Okay, you are put on trial. The Senate sits as the jury on this trial. The Supreme Court sits as the judges on this trial. And it's the House of Representatives that acts, in fact, as prosecutor, bringing the impeachment charges. Twice a president has been impeached. Andrew Johnson, uh, following the American Civil War in the 1860s, and President Bill Clinton in the 1990s. Twice those uh, Impeachment proceedings have been brought once against each of them, and each time the men were found innocent. So not, not to say, I want you to get clear, that to be impeached does not mean to be found guilty of a crime. It simply means to be put on trial. Okay, what is going on with the president and being elected? The president is elected by a thing called the Electoral College. This is something we mentioned earlier. <clears throat> the Electoral College is a system put into place by the Founding Fathers to provide something of a buffer zone when it came to allowing the average person to elect the president. Again, coming out of the Constitution, one of the most profound changes was this notion of a president, the idea that we would, in effect, elect our king, for lack of a better term. And there was some concern about that. The idea that the average person would have a say in the king seemed to terrify some of the uh, people in America who just felt that that was extending democracy far too far. So they put in something of a buffer zone. You would vote for the person you thought you wanted to be president, but there was a, another layer of electors appointed by party officials to determine exactly who they would be. Now, in the last 100 and plus years, these electors have regularly voted for the person they've been assigned to vote for. Uh, they followed popular expression. But there were several times over the first 100 years of our country's history when they didn't, when they would change their votes. Sometimes that was politically motivated, sometimes not. But the electors have played a much more uh, aggressive role in the first half of our country's history than recently. But now presidents are elected by the Electoral College. And this is something that's debated every four years when elections come around. Uh, because uh, frequently, the you know, last election I believe was the election of 2000, you would have somebody elected who gets more popular votes but is not elected because they don't get the majority vote and, uh, of the Electoral College. And there's some concern about that. A lot of people debate that. Another issue with the president, executive privilege. This is something that, again, started back in the day with Washington, has grown since then immensely. But in our country, there is a sense of, of desire to see transparency amongst our political officials. We want the president to be honest and open with us about what he's doing. The president, however, uh, claims what is called executive privilege. That is to say, the right to keep secrets. He says there are certain things that it just is, it does not behoove uh, the American nation 
to have everybody know. Uh, negotiations going on, uh, war plans, etc. secrecy. Um, this is a tension in American history between what the president uh, wants to claim as executive privilege that Americans don't need to know, and perhaps what he is simply hiding because he doesn't want Americans to know. Uh, the press plays a big role in this, politicians play a big role in this, and this is something that is part of that executive office, this idea of executive privilege, where the president claims the right to keep things from the people because of national security or, or other uh, such claims, and the people have to be compelled and convinced of this. And that's a tension that comes and goes, sometimes as far as the Supreme Court. The Watergate issue was a classic example of this. Well, who helps the president? <clears throat> if the president is the chief executive, he obviously has to have a lot of help. Uh, probably the most important person near the president uh, would be someone like the chief of staff who, who would help him organize his people. Um, here are some rules of thumb to keep in mind. Number one, the closer to the president, the more powerful. Uh, one of the things you can do is you watch news on, on TV or, or uh, computer. The people that you see nearby the president, physically near him, are often the people that are uh, his closest advisors. It might not have anything to do with their title or their job description. One of the rules of thumb in American history is whoever's office is nearest the president uh, is somebody the president has a lot of, or has a lot of access to the president, and the president depends on a lot. Almost invariably, the president will choose his closest advisors from his close friends. These are people that have been with him throughout the years. Uh, they were probably partners with him when he was uh, in his early political career. They've worked up the ranks with him. He's these are people that he trusts, and the people that he's going to choose for his uh, chief of staff and press secretary and other people like that that are gonna have his ear, that are gonna be in those, in those meetings all the time with him are gonna be people from his closest friends. The official group that helps the president is called the cabinet. And this is uh, a group that began with Washington uh, back in the 1790s. Washington himself realized that as small as the country was, he would need some help. And so he appointed some people to run different parts of the executive branch. And this is expanded up to the uh, more than 15 or so different uh, cabinet posts today. These people have to be approved by the Senate. Again, they are appointed by the president, approved by the Senate, and they do everything from defense to treasury to uh, secretary of state, homeland security, all those kinds of things. Well, as president, what is the president responsible for? It's an extraordinary job. The president has many hats. He plays many roles. And I want to just wrap up just kind of reminding you or identifying a few of these for you. Obviously, he is the chief of state. This is his role that's perhaps closest to that of the king. He has to do things like, uh, you know, throw out the first pitch of the baseball season, light the Christmas tree on the White House lawn, those kinds of things. He has sort of a symbolic role. He is the person that most um, of the other people in the world identify closely with who is America. It would be the president. So the president has a symbolic role. He's also our chief executive. Obviously, it is his job to make sure that all of the laws are enforced. Okay, any law that Congress passes, thousands a year, has to be enforced. It's enforced by a part of the executive branch, and all of that pyramids up to the President of the United States. It's fundamentally his job to make sure the laws are enforced. It's also his job to be our chief diplomat. He has to appoint ambassadors. He has to make treaties. He has to deal with the UN. It is his job as president to have everything to do with our international relations. Also his job as commander in chief, these two intertwine. He heads up the armed forces. Sometimes these international relations don't go as we would like and ships need to be sent to the Persian Gulf or this or that. It's his job to make sure all of that happens and it's ultimately his responsibility to determine the use of nuclear weapons. He is the chief legislator. Believe it or not, more bills are initiated by the president or by the president's uh, aides in Congress, uh, not, I shouldn't say aides, by the president's representatives in Congress, senators or representatives, or the president will put his ideas out there. But the idea is it's the president who comes up with most of the legislation. He does this in a couple of ways. He does it ongoing, but also in his State of the Union speech. Uh, every year, Congress uh, meets, and the Constitution says that the president must give an State of the Union. Uh, and this has become a very important speech that he gives, usually in early January. 
And in that speech, he announces his goals and his expectations and his legislative program for the coming year. And then he gets senators and representatives loyal to him to initiate those bills and work them through Congress. Most of the laws passed by the Senate and the House are initiated by the president's or the president's people. And finally, he's also the party leader. That is, he leads his particular party. Uh, President Obama currently is a Democrat, so officially he is the head of the Democratic Party. Now, he has people under him that help organize it and run it, of course, but fundamentally it all funnels up to him. As you can tell, this is an extraordinary job, and in our next lecture we're going to talk about the different men that have held this throughout American history. <laughs>